Welcome to Behind the Scenes at ID8 Studios, the place where we explore the art of producing art. I'm Steve Sue with Crystal Baki and our good friend, John LeBlanc. Hey, John, how's it? I'm good. How are you? The silent hello. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. And you're going to enlighten us on how to put a band together, which is going to be music to Crystal's ears. Yes, because I would love to know how to get a band together. I would, I, that's a dream of mine to do that. Okay. Well, let's make it happen. Yeah. Because you've done many bands of your own, right? I have, yeah. Actually, the first one was sidestepping a science fair in middle school. Not sidestepping, but thinking of a more creative way to enjoy. Does that mean that means getting out of doing something, sidestepping? Well, no. So we, <clears throat> we were, I was at the Abbott Middle School in Westford, Massachusetts, and we were doing a water carnival, and it was a science fair type of thing, a showcase of school projects that was related to water conservation and water quality and anything water related. And uh, it just seemed like an awful lot of work and research <laughs> and things that weren't that fun. And at the time I was playing guitar, I'd taken piano lessons for years and there were some guys in my class that were pretty good. We had a drummer that was you know, playing with the state bands and, and, and pretty solid and, and a sax player who was just incredibly musical, Beatles fanatic. And we decided, well, Instead of doing a boring booth with a bunch of construction paper, let's put together a band. And so that was my first band, and it was just my classmates at the Abbott Middle School. And we were called Acid Rain <laughs> in order to, you know, be on topic for the water carnival. Yeah. Smart. And we took hit songs and we converted them a little bit. So, so. so you're like teaching a topic on something? Well, it, it was, it was really more self indulgent than it was uh, uh, informative, I think. We took Mrs. Brown, You've Got a Lovely Daughter and turned it into Mrs. Brown, You've Got Polluted Water. Ah, <laughs> and we took, we took Wild Thing and it became Wet Thing and we played Wipeout because that seemed sort of water related. <laughs> and so how many songs did you guys prepare for this? Oh boy, it was a bunch. I mean, it was a, it's funny because, you know, when you're playing in your very first band in middle school, you don't have a concept of how long a set is. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> how long is a set? In feeling time. Well, generally, you know, it's a 45 minute deal. So, you know, you, you play, if you're playing for an hour, you play for 45 minutes, take a 15 minute break, do another 45 minutes. So, I see. So, that's kind so of So, the science rate, did you just loop that process like 45 minutes of the same songs and then you take a break in 45 minutes? Of the same songs? <laughs> well, we, I, you know, I don't know. We didn't really have a concept of sort of time. I think we just learned as many songs as we could as pretty novice players in the seventh grade. So, you guys all got together just because you were friends, first of all. We got to get, well, I mean, I guess we were all involved in various things like soccer and, and baseball and the scouts and church and things like that. But uh, I guess what I'm asking, though, is, is did you go out and draft specific people for this band or was it a ragtag group that just said, yeah, I want to be in a band. Let's go. It was fairly ragtag, except that everybody had the distinct qualification that they were passable on an instrument. OK, let's just say they owned an instrument. <laughs> <laughs> which was you know that and that sort of you know limited the pool of candidates anyway so that's yeah. that's what we had but we yeah we were pretty full band because we had a we had a uh, two singers that would double on percussion we had a guitar bass drums sax player and our sax player i think doubled on keyboards who's a very musical guy so this is a lot of pieces yeah it's yeah. pretty it's ambitious. not a power trio yeah it was, it was more than that and I think it was good because the more the more people, the more we could fill in the gaps of what we didn't really have the, the skills to be able to play. So mm -hmm. what percentage of ragtag bands that come together are actually done ragtag, or are they generally drafting parts and instruments for the type of music they want to play? Oh, wow. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I mean, I don't, I don't claim to have knowledge of, of <laughs> all of the bands that have ever been assembled, but... But, I mean, your experience... Yeah, you. well, I mean, my experience of, of my early bands was whoever was nearby and available... You know, I mean, pre Craigslist, it was a little harder to, to, to discover that talent pool. So a lot of my early bands were, you know, my two of my best friends that lived in my neighborhood, and you know, we ended up doing various configurations of of, of a trio. You know, sort of swapping instruments and things, and and uh, that was how some of my early bands got together. But when I moved to the city after high school. And again, this is pre Craigslist. We had the Boston Phoenix, which was the free public paper, and it was thick. And their classified ads were amazing. So well, that used classified ads to find other musicians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. There was a musicians wanted, and, and I don't know and what Craigslist was big for that. 
Well, this is before Craigslist. So this is, you know, Craigslist was what took the place of these, ah. these ads. And the ads, of course, were, you know, real small. So you have a, a sentence to be able to relay exactly what you're looking for. It's kind of hard to convey. A, oh, a, so yeah. you a would put an ad to get to draft people. Well, I, I answered an ad, and, that, and that's how I ended up in my first sort of city band. They were just looking for a guitarist, and I think they had listed a couple of influences, and there were bands that I were into it. I was into at the time, and uh, yeah, I answered the. And, and it's funny because they were all in abbreviations, right? It's like Twitter style because they need to fit it in a certain amount of oh, characters. Yeah. 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 <laughs> what and do you recommend to people who like don't know where to go? I like now nowadays looking for people to be in a band. Well, I mean, there's little pockets of scenes all over the place. So, mm -hmm. I mean, that would be the first place that I would start. Is if there's a certain genre that you like, I would go hit those shows and see who's in the audience. Because if people are coming to see music, chances are they're looking for inspiration or they're already into that style. So well, they, they'd be in your vibe, too, yeah. right? So yeah. maybe that's the reason why it's really good to work with your friends, because they kind of get you and you get them. And yeah. There's a bit of harmony built in, right? Yeah, although, you know, you can you can ruin a friendship, too, in a band, too, because it's... It can be challenging <laughs> at times, you know. Yeah. And That's a whole new podcast right there, man. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Managing the personalities—that's the—that's the tricky thing. I think that you you see all these behind the music episodes of all these like tumultuous yeah. relationships that these bands have because they're uh, you know fooling around with each other or they're you know they're uh, just well, they, spending well, they too much time in quote in close quarters or yeah. they they just have their own opinions and feel like they're being stifled or there's always that conflict of the songwriters getting all the royalties and then the side men just not making it and then you have this you know wealth you know disparity which creates a lot of uh, envy so and when you're putting a band together do you consider those things well i mean normally you kind of fall into these things and then they they really evolve over time i mean you don't you don't have a dynamic from the get-go it kind of evolves but um tell us about your current band Current band, yeah. So currently I play in a band called the Island Kings, and we do primarily corporate events and weddings. And it's uh, it's amazing. I mean, it's a, it's a different beast than an original band because we're just playing the hits. So no matter what, people are going to love us. Yeah. A little different than creating your own original material and, and trying to sell it. You know, like our, our songs are already sold. Like they're already mm -hmm. been, they've been number ones for decades. So, <laughs> so we're good to go. But the thing that I really like about it is that it's a group of professionals that do their homework, they show up prepared. We don't even normally rehearse because you know we, as experienced players, we know how to rehearse on our own and make sure that we show up knowing our parts and anticipating what other people are gonna do. So it's a, it's a little different. Yeah, how does that work when you're rehearsing on your own and then you come together, you just do like one run through and then just see where everyone's at or? You know, the, all, the, all the other players have been playing so long that they're just kind of automatic. You know, I think w once they once they know the structure of the song and they know which version of it we're going to do, mm -hmm. and that, that usually comes out a week in advance. You get the set list that's created by the band leader that says, here's a song we're doing, here's the original artist, or not the original artist, but the artist's rendition that we want to cover in the key that we want to do it in. And then you just listen to it and play it like the record, and then it's, because people want to hear it like the record. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, uh, and so you just keep it close to that. And then once you've been playing with certain people, you know what their tendencies are. And you, you build this shared vocabulary and this musical telepathy where you can kind of anticipate where people are going to go. Because yeah. creatively, people have sort of their tendencies, you know, their, their pockets that they move How about for beginners? Like when you, d like the first time, like I had a rehearsal for the first time and I didn't even know what to do. When was this? Uh, like uh, last month. Oh, cool. Yeah. So, and so you're I, doing stuff. Yeah, I mean, I... I I we we met up and it's like do you just pick a song and jam out to it and then see like I don't I didn't even know what to do. Wow, that's well, that's an interesting question. You know, a lot of times there's like a leader that emerges, and um, you know I, I'm a little bit of a strong personality. Like I'm, I pride myself in being kind of easygoing, but I tend to take a leadership role in these situations, which is is not. It's not good. You don't really want me as your leader. I prefer, I, that's why I prefer my current band, because I can just kind of show up and, and be the guitarist. And, I'm, and I'm, tab, I'm tagged to be the leader sometimes, which just means you know, coordinating everybody and getting the songs together and making sure that everybody's on the same page. But um, yeah, a lot of times it's, a, it's, it's helpful to have a voice that gives you a direction because it gives you that momentum. And it's just, you know, it's important that there's that healthy conversation to make sure that that person isn't a dictator 
you know, that people resent. But uh, yeah, I found that, and in, in, in sometimes it's, it's stressful when people rely on you to supply the material or be the one that, that makes the choices. Like sometimes it's, it's nice if it's democratic, but very seldom is it ever. I mean, in my experience anyway. And with original music, it, how do you make it a collaborative environment? Or is it, here's the music sheet, this is how it's going to go? It always depends. I mean, I prefer a collaborative environment because I'm, I'm overwhelmed by the idea of you know, really fine-tuning everything and handing out to people and saying, here, play this. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times I'll, I'll have sort of the guitar parts and the main structure of the song, and then I'll relay that and say, like, whatever you think fits here, and, and not you know, shove something down somebody's throat. Other people are a lot more cutthroat about that stuff. They want it done a certain way. Mm. You know, you, and yeah, I mean, it really kind of depends. I, I like the, I like the collaborative process. And I, it's usually someone who's like, okay, this is the key, and this is the solo area where you're gonna play. Is, s- sometimes, sometimes it just evolves from a jam. Like somebody plays a beat, oh, I like that. Oh, okay. And somebody throws a, a bass line down on top of it, and that gives you your foundation to put the other layers on top of it. it really depends. Well, how did you put your band together? You got a band I, all of a sudden. I, I just know some people who play, and uh, we started by playing music that's already been written before, uh-huh. like from other artists. Yeah. Um, so that's how we're starting. But I am curious how you have, like if I have an idea and I want it to sound like this song, I, I, I go tell my guitarist that I like this vibe. And then, and then like, where do you go? Like, here are the lyrics now that I hear in my head. You're and talking then... for original music, not covers, right? Yeah, original music. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, having a having a, a starting point is a really good thing. I want it to sound like this. Like, if you go into a recording studio, usually the engineer will or the producer will ask you, like, well, what do you want it to sound like? Because there's a million different ways to sort of, like, you know, mic and treat just the drums. Right, right. right. Like, do you want it real ringy? Do you want it muted? Do you want it to sound like it's in the basement of a castle? Or do you want to make it sound That's like cool. it's That's cool. I never a... thought of it that way. Yeah. Even just drums, like yeah. instrumental drums. Uh, yeah. That's cool. Yeah. And it's it's something that if you're not really tuned into it, you might not even notice it. But when you hear an engineer describe, you know, here's a here's a dry drum sound versus a wet drum sound. And, and just, you know, how the trends have happened over time. Like, think about uh, Phil Collins when he came out with his drum sound. All of the pop drums after that kind of sounded like that, where there was a gate on it, and it was just larger than life, and, and uh, you don't notice, so you kind of tune into it. But the fact that you have that model of, like, okay, here's, here's our starting point, mm. then you can make decisions about how you want to, you know, vary from there. I think that's a good a good thing to do. And, and I think that's what, like back to the Boston Phoenix classifieds, that's where our band started with was, was you know, here are, the, here are our influences, here's who we like. And then you kind of get an idea, okay, great. So they want to be a little bit more uh, dance oriented, rock and roll with, uh, you know, a lot of pieces and a lot of improvisation sprinkled in. Oh, that sounds great. But the, it really sounds like there's a huge difference, Crystal, between what John's doing and what your aspirations are, because your aspirations sound like more custom your music. Yeah. Versus other people's classics. And I, I think you probably need to do a lot of writing and orchestration and whatever, you know, because you can't just like expect a guitarist to know the part. Sit in, know the part. Yeah. John's right. speaking to the idea of like a, a just s- bringing sound it together. engineer. Yeah. Putting reverb in if that's the right vibe for the moment. But <laughs> ultimately, is there a way, John, to combine the two? Like you have some of your own original music interspersed with other people's music oh yeah people do it all the time i mean you know a lot of bands do start with covers because that's how you build the momentum you know it's kind of hard to start with an empty page and 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 create magic it's there's a lot of interplay that happens so you need to kind of get a get that shared vocabulary with people and get a feel for people's tendencies and know what they're capable of and know what they sound like and know what they want to sound like and 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 play to their strengths as you're doing your writing you know, these are totally, you know, yeah. two different things of the cover band versus an original band. But mm-hmm. it's, you know, there's the, the the problem is with the when you show up and play covers, it's like when the gig's over, like you're done getting paid versus you write your original music. You can license that stuff. You can you can get paid for the plays on the radio and on Spotify and for licensing. And so that's that's the way to go. I think the the thing for me is that I can e- very easily overthink and over 
overproduce and over manipulate things and things will maybe never get finished because I'm constantly, <laughs> you know, adding something to it or tweaking it or just not happy with it or you need the next section and I have a writer's block versus a live gig where you're playing somebody else's songs. There's a beginning, middle and end. And, you know, if it's if it's not great, it's done. If it is great, it's done too. But, it, you know, you don't, it doesn't drag on versus you know, you're doing original material. You can, and, and the most magical stuff usually happens in one sitting. So you, it's probably a good sign if it's taking forever that it's not really going anywhere. But it's a it's a different vibe. You know, we, 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 we get there, we hit hard. You're very centered and very focused and very in the moment and very alive. And then, and then it's over and you don't really have to think about it. Like your work is done. Wow. So it's a different... Yeah vibe but you know there's benefits to both really yeah are there any trends that are happening in like bands forming or i don't know well i mean now you know you've got this focus right preamp right here (laughs) or you know this this digital interface that has unlocked the creativity of everybody i mean particularly i mean how many of those things did they sell during the pandemic everybody's got one of those and for very little money well yours a little nicer than mine but uh, (laughs) for a very affordable price you've got a professional quality capture device that goes right to your computer so mm-hmm. now people can lay down track after track without even like you know working with anybody and and there's your demo in, in really high quality i mean there's people that are that are using that same device to do professional quality recording and granted they're going out to maybe mixing and mastering for sweetening later but i mean that's that's a professionally professional quality piece of equipment that would have cost thousands of dollars not that long ago. Nice. And now everybody's got them at home. With and I mean, engineer too, right? Yeah. yeah. You can self-engineer. Yeah. Yeah. And, and these nice mics you guys already have. I mean, here you go. So I think the trend is that, you know, a lot of people are self-sufficient and, and there's lots of tools out there that give you interesting backing tracks and give you interesting instruments out of the box that aren't that cost prohibitive. So it gives people the ability to just go nuts on their own. And, and unfortunately, you see that in the live world, too, in that, you know, particularly in Waikiki, you see a lot of soloists that are just like playing to a looper. Mm. And it's and, and I think that's that's a money thing, you know, because you you know you move here from the mainland to become a, a manager at a hotel and the pressure is on you to not spend any money. And, you know, the, the cheapest thing you can get is one person that's their own backing band. So you see that a lot. And that's a trend that I'm not super happy about. I mean, I'm happy for my friends that loop well and are able to throw down the rhythm track and then loop a bass line over it, loop a guitar part and then mm-hmm. sing multiple harmonies over themselves. But it doesn't give me the same electricity that I get in front of a big band that has specialized experts at their instrument contributing their parts on yeah. an ongoing basis. All right then, then. John, thank you so much for teaching us how to put a band together. Oh, I don't know if I did a good job. <laughs> this one's ready. She's, she's, she's queued up. She's I'm on ready. deck. All right, well, now you get me thinking about it next time when we come right. back. We yeah. can... And how can those guys find out more about you and your brand? Oh, those guys. Hi, guys. I'm uh, John LeBlanc, and you can reach me at johnleblanc.com. It's got all the links to my social and links to my contact form, so reach out. Yay, and for more on BTS at ID8, check out ID8studios.org. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.